Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to the day of Pentecost. To this beautiful day, this beautiful sunny day, our Heavenly Father has made for us to come together as a congregation in praise, prayer, worship, song, and celebration. The announcements as are in the bulletin are the announcements are concerns from the congregation at this time. Pastor. Thank you, David. It's nice to see so many people who in the past have been fighting one illness after another, the flighters or Betty. We could go on through the whole congregation and praise God. In fact, let's start off with praising God. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are there for us when we need you the most. And that we can be there for that you can be there for us not only when it's a time of difficulty, but a time of joy. And we ask that you continue to bless us each in this congregation. We're looking forward to next week to having uh, Lori Gruby, Laura Gruby, spend time with us playing the violin. Also, ask that you keep the Cokers in mind, and as you pray for. Uh, Barbara and her husband and family. Are there any other prayer requests? Jim, are you getting up to for prayer requests or? Okay. In that case, that's. I'm sorry. Yeah, I I heard about that. Let's, let's pray for them specifically. Heavenly Father, you know our every need and our every desire. And you know how difficult it can be for us to actually thank you for all the ways in which you've been there for us and for our family. We, in particular, ask that you continue to bless Sylvia and also give her the kind of peace that only you can give the peace that passes all of our understanding because it comes from you. And we ask that you be with Sylvia and their family so that no one can doubt that you love them and care for them. In your name, amen. Any other prayer requests? Okay. Let's turn to the order of confession. The brief order of confession found on page 56. Please rise. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of your, our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved you. Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his only son to die for us 
and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll continue with the apostolic greeting. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. Let us together pray the prayer of the day. O God, you taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them to your Holy Spirit. Grant us by the same Spirit to have right judgment in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
as a rest to the weary. Come as a balm for the soul. Come as a dew to my dryness. Fill me with joy The first reading comes from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Here ends the first reading. We will now read responsively Psalm 139, verses 1 to 15. Lord, you have searched me out and known me, 
You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O Lord, know it all together. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it, attain to it. If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make the grave my bed, you are there also. Even there, your hand will lead me, and your right hand hold me fast. Darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. I will thank you because I am marvel marvelously made. Your works are wonderful, and I know it well. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. They were fashioned day by day, when as yet there was none of them. The second reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost arrived, the apostles were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwellings in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with a new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last day it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter, starting with verse 26. Jesus said, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, 
For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world according, concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the rule of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you to all, into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whoever the truth. Wherever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. We're now singing the first three verses of hymn 683. Please be seated. I don't know whether I mentioned it earlier, but this coming Sunday, we will have Laura Gruby with us to play the violin. If you haven't had a chance or taken the opportunity to hear her play, it's a pure joy. The, not only the sounds that she can make out of this violin that I once had to practice when I was a kid, and, but also because she puts her whole self into it. And that's a gift that we're looking forward to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know us better than we know ourselves. There's no place that we could go where you cannot find us. And we ask that you could today help us to remember that there is no place where the Holy Spirit cannot work. And so on this day when we have festivities surrounded around Pentecost, we ask that you help us to acknowledge the Spirit in our lives. Amen. I'm trying to get my glasses straightened out here. We're going to be taking a closer look at the chapter 15, verses 26, and uh, verses uh, of the Holy Spirit, chapter 16. One of my favorite preachers is a man by the name of Tony Campolo. Have any of you ever listened to him or heard him on the radio? He's an American Baptist, not Southern Baptist. He's an American Baptist, and he's one of the finest speakers and preachers that I've ever heard. When he was very young, 
He decided to go to Haiti. In fact, since then, he has gone on to Haiti many, many times and has founded an orphanage there. But when he was very young, he went to Haiti and he stayed in a hotel and he was very hungry. And so he ordered the food and the food came and it was pre prepared just right. It was delicious. And just as he was taking his second bite, he looked in a window and there were six little boys, six little faces staring at him while he was eating this wonderful food. And he called the waiter over and said, is there something that we can do about this? And the waiter said, sure. He said, let's pull the blind. That way you won't have to worry and have to look at him. And since then, Campolo has often talked about the fact that you and I are so prone to pull the blind on the things that we don't want to see, that we don't want to look at. We ask God to protect us from the evil one and yet we also know that that's where our growth takes place. And so here we are with Tony Campolo finally uh, convincing the waiter that he cannot eat the food anymore because the little faces just keep on staring in his face. That's the kind of work that Tony Campolo has ever since done. He has allowed himself to feel the very things that you and I often are prone to cover up, to not participate in, because it's the kind of thing that isn't just right. I remember one time serving in a church, and in that particular church they wanted to have a kindergarten that the community wanted to plan. And the community was ready to plant this kindergarten in the church itself, and the council had to vote on it, and the council voted not to have anyone come because they might make the floor dirty. And I remember asking them, do you ever consider the fact that if Christ were here, that his blood might actually, actually, actually make this floor dirty as well? But you know, let's not dwell on that for a moment. Take it home and think about it. But let's, let's look more closely at what Jesus is telling us about the Holy Spirit. You see, this chapter, in fact, four, chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17 are considered to be the farewell address of uh, Jesus as he's preparing to return to the Father. And in this particular situation, we've already looked at the shepherd and vine and various other metaphors and analogies. But in this particular chapter, Jesus goes farther. He not only says that, he, that we are to be followers of him, but he goes on to say, I will send you a helper. Now, why would he want to send the disciples a helper? Why would any of you here, any of us here, actually want the, the uh, helper for us? Because Jesus recognizes. He recognizes that you and I can't handle the blinds by ourselves. We would be totally lost if we actually needed to go and actually deal with the outside on our own terms, with the world, the secular world, on our own terms. And so Jesus says to the disciples, hey, you know what? I'm not going to leave you alone. I've been with you, but I'm not going to leave you alone now. In fact, I'm going to send you a helper. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witnesses because you've been with me from the beginning. You see, Jesus isn't leaving you alone. I know a number of you have on various occasions told me there's one thing that I don't think I can do, and that is to evangelize, to try to talk to somebody else about Jesus. But he wants us to talk about him. He wants us to be with other people and to acknowledge not the kind that, we're, that you and I wear on our sleeves, but the kind that challenges us to be more than we could possibly be on our, on our own. And so then I will send you the helper. 
And then what's the help we're going to do? Dropping down chapter 16. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. I do not go, if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. First of all, concerning sin. What Jesus is saying is that the helper will actually, the Holy Spirit, will help us to recognize what is bad, what is wrong. He will help us to understand what we don't understand or want to understand. And that is that we need the helper. We need the Holy Spirit. Every one of us here does. We need the Spirit in order to understand ourselves and to understand the world. But not only do we need the Spirit, we also, the Spirit to help us with the Helper and to convict us of sin, He also wants us to convict us of righteousness. Now, the question that lies behind there is, on first we have what is wrong, sin, now we have what is right. The helper wants us to see not only those things which are difficult, but he wants us to see what is right. And then third of all, he wants us not only to see what is right, but he wants us to know that he is going to win. The judgment is in Christ's hands, not in yours. He is the one who will make it possible for you not only to overcome the difficulties, the sinfulness, not only to hold up the righteousness, but also to understand that in fact our Lord and Savior is there to be there with us so that we will be victorious in the end run. Now Kierkegaard, Søren Kierkegaard, was a sweetly uh, Danish philosopher, theologian, member of the church for a while. And um, he made, told us one time through a little essay that he wrote that um, we have to be careful because, you see, we are all constantly put in a position where God himself will challenge you and me in a way that will make it difficult for us to live a normal life. And he, the story that he wrote was about this thief. And the thief went into an apartment store, a department store. And in the department store, the thief was looking around. And this was not an ordinary thief. This was a thief who took one price tag from one piece of furniture and exchanged it with another price tag from another piece of furniture. Or all the way through, he replaced the values on the various items that the thief was identifying. And of course, the owner was very upset. But the point that Kierkegaard makes for us is that he wants us to understand that once we become followers of Christ, things will never be the same. Our values will be different. And you can, without my having to do it, you can identify those areas where the value system that you have is not making it clear to you what following Jesus really means. So here he is telling people, I will help you to identify what is right, what is wrong, and that the victory is on your side. Now there's one other matter that I need to take care of. That is the fact that right in the middle of all of this passage, let me read it to you. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witnesses because you have been with me from the beginning. Let's focus on that just a little bit. You see, Jesus, when he's talking to his disciples, isn't just satisfied with the knowledge that they have about right, wrong, and even who might win. He wants us to be witnesses. He wants us to be witnesses to what God has, is doing in our world. And there, there's a story, that, a true story, that I like to tell and to illustrate this point. And that is that, in fact, we do have, we are witnesses, whether we like it or not. And this is a story about a man by the name of Gene Pynchon. 
Gene Pynchon was an attorney in uh, Chicago. And he was a black attorney who didn't have a lot of initial favor with the community, but he was so powerful in his person that people started listening to him, going to him. He eventually became a judge and he was just one of the most powerful people in the whole area. And Gene Pynchon uh, was a very big man with a big heart. And the first case that he was ever assigned when in those days when you wanted to start off your practice, usually the court assigned you someone. We have a different system now. But the first case that he was assigned was a case in which a man was accused of killing his wife. And he denied it. And Gene Pynchon represented him. And as he represented him, it struck me that there was one fact which was in his favor, but only one. And the, the fact that was in his favor is that no one had ever found the body. Nobody knew where the body was. And so when it came time for the trial, the court, the prosecutors put on their case and pointing out that he didn't need a body and so forth and so forth. And when it came time for Gene Pynchon, he didn't say anything, he just sat down and said, the defense rests. The defense rested, and then he got up and he said, you know, he said, I'm not really just resting, he said, because there's one fact that the prosecution seems to skip over, and that is that in fact, no body was ever found. And there's a good reason for that. The reason is that he did not kill his wife, and in five minutes, she's gonna be walking through those doors. And he sat down. And the eyes of the jury was glued. And they went back to deliver. And less than five minutes later, they had a verdict. They came out and had the verdict of guilty. And Gene Pynchon couldn't understand. He said, wasn't his argument good? His argument was so powerful in many ways that uh, people to this day look at that argument and use it in courtrooms. And so here they were, waiting, waiting, waiting. And finally the door opened and nobody came out. And then Gene Pincham stood up and said, you notice, he said, I didn't play a trick on you. You might have thought so. I didn't play a trick on you because the defense has to prove its case. I mean, the plaintiff has to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. And all of you were looking at the door, waiting for the tractor to pass by all of you, he said to the jury, were waiting for the jury to come back, but they didn't because they, nobody proved the case beyond a reasonable doubt. If you had, reasonable, had no reasonable doubt, then you wouldn't have looked at the door. And then he, he went, Gene Pincher went to the foreman of the jury and said, why? He said, didn't you look yeah, and aren't you a person who has reasonable doubts? Yeah. Didn't you have a reasonable doubt? Yeah, I did. He said, then why could you hold my client guilty? He said, because from where we were sitting, we could see your client, and he wasn't looking. You see, when you and I are called to be witnesses for our Lord and Savior, we are called to be followers of Christ. And we're going to be judged by the standards of the world. In fact, we're going to be looked at very closely if we claim that we are Christians. Because, why? Because Jesus Christ himself is ready to be there for us and with us. Amen.
Let us confess our faith using the Nicene Creed found on page 64. Found on page 64, the Nicene Creed. And right after the Nicene Creed, we will take up our offering. I believe in God, heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. things were made Let us pray. Merciful Father, we offer a joy and thanksgiving which you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your precious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now turn to the great thanksgiving.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who rose beyond the bounds of death and on this day, as he had promised, poured out your spirit of life and, and upon the chosen disciples. At this, the whole earth exults in boundless joy. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same manner, after they had supped, he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As Lutherans, we believe that Christ is truly present in these elements. If you share that belief and have been baptized, come. This is not our table. This is the Lord's table. Please rise. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you through his grace unto eternal life. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. We pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Before we continue, I, I think I should give recognition. Somebody, some of you may have seen that I was sort of stumbling a little bit there. And uh, uh, there might be a reason for that. Now, since the worship service is over, I thought I could, you know, we could. Sam, aren't you, weren't you in on, on this? There's Sam and Mike. You should hightail it out of here because he was, he was the one. Um, Red stag. Well, we'll come back some other day. Go in peace, serve the Lord. <laughs> 